there. Welcome to Newsnight, where we speak to major players in Nigeria's democracy and the issues raised by its drive for growth and development. I am Ladi Akiri Duluale. Thanks for your company. The transformation of the biggest player in Nigeria's oil and gas industry into a private sector company after more than four decades as a government agency brings with it much to ruminate on. Apart from a change in name, does this mean that Nigerians will get much more value addition than in the past, as well as higher levels of transparency and accountability? What's to happen to the structure of the subsidy for petrol? And will this mean a rise in prices? What about the nation's refineries currently said to be undergoing rehabilitation? What will be their position under this new arrangement? Newsnight talks to the Group Managing Director of the Nigeria National Petroleum Corporation, the NNPC, Malam Mele Kiari. Malam Kiari, thank you for your time. Thank it's you. nice to see you again. Thank you very much. Good to see you again. And indeed, our sincere condolences uh, on the passing away of uh, Malam Bakindo. Thank you, man. We're deeply hurt. We were as well. We were as well. Uh, may God grant him eternal rest. Thank you very much. In a couple of hours, a transformation will take place that some people doubted would happen. Others didn't think it would happen so soon. And others are still waiting to see what exactly is going to be different. So that's where I want us to start. Um, NNPC is uh, colossus uh, within the Nigerian operating space. So what's going to change beyond the fact that it will have the appellation limited added to it? What else is going to change, um, for example, in its structure? Let's start with the structure. Yes, first, uh, I think we got stuck in time. Uh, over the long period of time, every effort to make sure that this company becomes a fully commercial company didn't work out because there weren't the enabling environment nor the enabling legislation to support it. Every attempt to put that in place didn't work out until we had the opportunity of the passage of the Petroleum Industry Act in 2021. And this, the basic difference is that today you have a framework that allows you to operate as a commercial company. Once you operate as a commercial company, you know, there are certain basic expectations. First, you can't lose. As uh, many Nigerians may be aware, we have, this company has been losing money for, for 43 years. And it didn't change until year 2020. And this, of course, uh, can now be seen in the context of a changing business environment. And this business environment needs to be enhanced, empowered by legislation and by regulation. And the situation we have today now is that you have a company that must operate as a fully commercial company, just another commercial company in the space. Just like many of our partners, global partners, or even local partners that are operating, and they don't lose money here. Uh, we have huge access to assets. We have huge access to capital. Uh, we have the trust of the, of the world, but they can't lend to you because they are not a fully a commercial company. And this is fast changing. So... As soon as this transformation comes into space and gets into execution mode, decision making will be easier. There will be ease of uh, transacting business with us. And more than anything else, you know, you're going to have a global organization. That organization must fit into the world's best practice. We will compress our structure in a manner that will deliver value to its shareholders. There will be leadership roles that will be clearly defined. There will be deeds of authority, both commercial, financial, and also other so, so, uh, soft uh, authorities that were not clearly put in place. But that you have to put now by law, also by the basic expectation of your shareholders, that you must have a slim company, a company that delivers value to its shareholders, an organization that has responsibility, individuals that have a single point of responsibility for everything. And that will change the entire structure of this company. And of course, delivering value will now become in multitude, bearing in mind that this is going to be the greatest and the largest capitalized company in Africa. Given that you mentioned that shareholders and uh, stakeholders, uh, up until now, everyone was on, I mean, we know that NNPC is owned by government. Um, so when you talk about shareholders in this transformation, what's going to change in that regard? Is, is government still going to be its largest shareholder or it's, it's going to have others who will come in at the point of the transformation? How far have we gone with that aspect of it? Yeah, the law allows for sell down of equity over a period of time, minimum of three years post 
passage of the petroleum industry act or post incorporation of the com company. There is a space for private people to take equity in this company. But as we speak now, the shareholders are the over 200 million Nigerians. Uh, the, what is simply happening today is the Ministry of Petroleum Incorporated and the Ministry of Finance Incorporated are holding those shares on behalf of all the other Nigerians. It can become much as sec second level of uh, private ownership that is by selling down some of this equity so that people can take it in their individual capacity, not in the collective capacity as a nation. So definitely the whole gamut of the changes will happen. Uh, and th this company must be IPO ready uh, immediately before you can talk about uh, selling, selling down of interest. And it means that you know, this company is efficient, it can run, it is run profitably. And we don't think it's going to wait for three years. Uh, we're already on the positive strength. And by the mid of next year, I'm very, very confident that this company will be in a place to say, yes, we are ready for IPO. And it will be the decision of the, uh, of the nation to go private completely in the sense that we can now say there are equity that is different from being owned by the generality of Nigerians. Prior to now, of course, you have JVs with international oil companies. You referenced that uh, 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 when we were talking before we came on. Uh, what's going to change about that? Because in your relationship with those IOCs, you had the implicit and explicit backing of the federal government of Nigeria. So you weren't just talking as a player, you were also talking as their, uh, shall we say, owner and regulator at the same time. But if you become a limited liability company, how will that alter that relationship? I'm very sure our partners are very happy today because uh, the law has clearly transferred all the joint venture assets to the NNPC Limited. The meaning of this or the implication of this is that NNPC is now in position to make business decisions, commercial decisions, financing decisions without recourse to any other authority. And as you may be aware, in the past, you know, by law, we are required to ensure that the National Assembly passes uh, the appropriation for the purpose of our contribution to the joint venture cash calls and all other obligations in the, that agreement. And that makes things a bit difficult because we understand clearly that government has obligations, have many things that they have to do. Government is not a commercial venture, and therefore that competes with other interests of, of government. And what this situation has thrown on the table is that NMPC must now look for financing without recourse to the state. And indeed, the law is very, very clear. It said that we will have no recourse to public funds. And the meaning of this is that it frees resources to the state so that they can focus on education, infrastructure and so many things that the state needs to do so that they don't need to go worry about how NMPC operates and NMPC now comes in to deliver the value that will be required to build up the other social infrastructure that we need in the country. Yes, it is indeed a history for our, our partners. Decision making will be very easy and cheap. Also, ability to access funding and financing will become much easier. We can do it collectively now. And indeed, the law actually allows that we can actually combat some of these joint ventures into incorporated joint ventures. That brings another layer of ability and capability, and I'm sure that you'll see the results uh, on the table very soon. You mentioned capital there, and so that brings me to the next, uh, to the point I was going to raise next, which is that up until now, uh, each time NNPC wanted money, it either went to government and it was given money, or it sought money from other uh, uh, sources but it had the backing of government. So it was like giving money to someone you were sure would, you would get your money back from. But now if you're going to operate strictly as a limited liability company, the rules are different, aren't they? Absolutely. And, and, but you seem to still be extremely confident that you're going to have it as easy as you've had it to access capital. Why is that? The, the difference is this. First, we can't go to government anymore for financing. And we can also not go for support for financing. The reason is very simple, that we can no longer ask for sovereign guarantee on any loan. So the sovereignty vanishes. So we are a business. Because we are a business, your lenders will only see your access to assets, your ability to produce value, and your ability over time to be able to pay back loan when you do this. And this will be very obvious when your lenders are aware that the assets are available to you, they are able to make quick decisions, you are also able to uh, make sure that this works for the uh, repayment of any loan that comes in. That's why lending will become much easier. In today's context, uh, before an MPC Limited, you must get the approval of government before you borrow because it will compete with other interests of government. And now that has vanished. That doesn't exist. And therefore, your partners need not ask that question. You're not going to have those delays that will be associated with this. And also, the very fact that you, can, you are now an individual company on your own. And people have to deal with it for who you are. And we're a big company, so people will deal with us for the big size that we have, the access to assets that we have, and the access to capital that we have.
is very different today. Two things, two key assets that uh, people that are visible, that people know that you have up until now, uh, are refineries and stations. So at either end of the yeah. of the value chain delivery, uh, what's going to alter about those um, in terms of? Because I know, for example, when I sat with you the last time, we were talking about the rehabilitation of the refineries, and at that time you mentioned that. Uh, a loan had been taken in order to facilitate that process, but there was a process. It was not the usual way that it was being done before. There was a new process by which that, how will all that feed into what we are doing now with NMPC? What's going to change in that respect? First the refineries and then the stations. Actually, uh, they are the least of our assets, but we clearly agree that they are the most visible of our assets. You know, When people measure NMPC, they measure us on the basis of our fuel stations and our visibility in the fuel space. So definitely uh, this is very unlikely to change because of the nature of transportation uh, infrastructure that we have in the country. We are still very much dependent on uh, combustion fuel uh, driven vehicles. That's very, very obvious. But I must tell you that is the list of our assets that we hold. You know, our core business is in the upstream and in the gas and power business. And 80% of our assets are actually in that category. Everything else just accounts for about 20% of our assets. Yes, we'll pay attention to it. It is critical. It is a matter of energy security for our country. We will get our refineries where we can build new ones if we need it, as we're already doing. And also to continue to expand our retail outlet uh, as wide as is possible so that we can provide all the necessary energy security requirements that the law has required NMPC Limited to do. So in that context, you know, our PL station will be there. Nigerians will see it. It belongs to them. Uh, they will be visible. There will be very obvious sign signal that NMPC is here. But more than anything, it's at the back of it all. You know, we have huge assets that is not visible to many people. And this is the crux of NMPC's business. When we talk about viability, um, you, you referenced it in your answer to the last question when you talked about um, combustion and that there's been a push until very recently there's been a push to move towards cleaner energies uh, wind solar nuclear all those kind of things and then one uh saw what happened with the war in ukraine and some of those who were doing everything the pushing, changed, everything yes changed. have have, have bit a retreat uh but the act the general argument that the move away from uh, fossil fuels uh or what were referred to as dirty fuels uh would make certain levels of businesses unviable. And someone even pointed me to the direction of Saudi Aramco, which would be something like what NNPC is about to become, except for uh, some characteristics, moving into petrochemicals to reduce its dependence on fossils. Uh, are you thinking along that line? Is that the kind of thing that NNPC too could be because right now, our major assets are this uh, fossil fuels and, of course, gas. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, we are not immune from the ongoing uh, push towards uh, putting cleaner fuel in, in the space. Uh, definitely, climate change is real. We know the impact of fossil fuel in the, on, the, on the climate. But having said this, you know, there's also a conversation around just transition. Few countries are in different level of uh, requirements and necessities. We are very different in our country today. You know, it's very difficult to say that in another two, three years' time, you will be at the, uh, the trip vehicle limit, limit, of, limit of transportation. So we will not be there. It's very, very unlikely for that to, to happen. Having said this, that means there's just transition. And the world has also accepted that to transit, you must have, take certain practical steps. And one of it is to accept gas as a transition fuel globally. And that, by the way, uh, it's very important to highlight that when they say, transition to cleaner fuel, it doesn't mean eliminate fossil fuel, convert it to much cleaner use. As a matter of fact, even by year 2050, the estimate is that 58% of global energy will be supplied from fossil fuel. So it's not eliminating uh, petroleum, absolutely not. You convert it to much uh, better, much cleaner use. And that's what our partners and our peers are doing across the globe. So what can we do different? Can we convert them to chemicals that are of less effect to the environment? Can we do blue hydrogen? And, and so on and so forth. There are so many interventions that are going on, but uh, you do that for the market that needs it. For instance, you know, if you do hydrogen today, in our context today, you probably don't need it, but there's a market for it. And therefore, companies are doing everything possible to convert their current refining capacities into something else so that it can deliver hydrogen in, in the plant. So it's a conversion process. 
it's a very, very big transition process and it doesn't eliminate any business, but businesses will change to fit into the new situation as we continue to provide energy for our country because you know, we're at a basic level now. For, for instance, 80% of Nigerians don't have access to clean cooking fuel. That means that you must do something to bring LPG on the table so that you can have access to clean cooking. Before you now talk about, okay, can we use electricity to do this? And because you have enormous resources to help you move in that direction, we'll continue to progress this as we also don't lose sight of the fact that we need to get cleaner and cleaner and, and ultimately we'll catch up with the world as our president has promised that we'll do the net zero by 2060. The meaning of that net zero by 2060 doesn't mean that petroleum is going to vanish in our country or in our lives. Petroleum will continue to be there. We'll probably in our own case, the 58% that is carried in the world is for the global situation. But in our case, we'll probably will still be at over 60 to 70% of that energy mix. Given, given that now, uh, most of those who are listening uh, to me, and in fact, those I, I said, oh, it looks like uh, uh, I might have the opportunity to speak to you. The question that they ask me in varying degrees is, does it mean that from the date uh, that we're uh, referencing, the 19th of July, um, NNPC becomes limited, it's a private company, so it's going to start behaving and start operating like the traditional marketers. And that means that they are going to be paying more for everything that NNPC puts out to the market from that day. I want you to use this opportunity to tell them what exactly is going to happen because that's the big elephant in the room. <laughs> it's actually, there's no elephant in the room this moment. <laughs> uh, I can tell you, uh, we have technically cut over to NNPC Limited with EFEC from 1st of July. The meaning of this is that all our transactions will now be on the basis of the Petroleum Industry Act's provision and also the Memorandum and Article of Association of the Companies, all other enabling uh, regulatory and institutional requirements that we need to put in place to make sure it works. So we're already in the NNPC Limited situation. We have transferred our assets to the NNPC Limited. We have also transferred our book of accounts into the NNPC Limited. So the company is real. It is here, it is operating in the best of form, and we're, of course, it's going to evolve more and more until we become IPO ready by the mid of next year. What will happen on the 20, 19th of uh, July is the official unveiling of this company by Mr. President, so that Nigeria will see the new face of this company, what new culture it represents, what it means to Nigeria, what it means to the global energy community, so that the world will work with us, so that we can deliver value, we can deliver efficient energy into the global space, and particularly more so in our country. Uh, in the case of the price of petroleum, this is a policy matter. Uh, NMPC is going to be a supplier to the Federation at a fee. You know? So the issue of at what price you sell petroleum will be the decision of, uh, of, of the state. If the state has uh, maintained that we'll continue to put subsidy on petroleum, product, we're happy to do this. But with a commercial venture, we'll have a service level agreement between us and, this, uh, and the state. We'll procure the products, we'll sell to the state, and literally, the state will step to the countrymen. I have seen no indication at this point in time that the state is ready to uh, change any price of petroleum products. It has nothing to do with our operations. Uh, for us, what it really means is that this is business for us. Uh, we'll charge them fee, and, and at any point, you know, so that this company can make money on behalf of its shareholders. Uh, more than anything, is uh, there's really no plan of tying this to our court over there. They have no relationship. The Transparency and Accountability Initiative. When last I spoke with you, uh, which is now about just over a year ago or just under a year ago, you referenced the fact that for the first time, and you've said it already again today, uh, that uh, for the first time in 43 years, NNPC actually had audited accounts, yeah. made money. Yes. Um, and a lot of people said, well, that's already a big change. Mm -hmm. uh, and then now there's this further change. How is that going to affect uh, the various questions that have arisen on the issues of transparency and accountability? I'll give you an example. When we mentioned the issue of subsidy, and people say, oh, OK, yes, as at uh, so, so, and so year, NNPC was procuring so, so, and so million liters on behalf of government. And of course, government was paying NNPC you know, how to do that and sell it at a particular price. Now, if NNPC is a completely commercial venture, as you've just said, it cannot do that. It's, it has to get paid for any service it offers Absolutely. because it, is go it has. Now, in that kind of situation, how do you see this working with reference to the transparency and accountability 
initiative exactly. that you started. Yeah. But which, of course, as you said on that occasion, you came up against very deeply entrenched interests. Exactly. Now, how are you going to take it when you don't have <laughs> the previous backing you had of Mr. Mm. President. You are now actually, a company CEO like everybody else. Yes. Actually, it now becomes more demanding to be more transparent. NMPC is a partner company for the Global EITI Initiative, uh, like very many other private companies that voluntarily chose to become partner company to the EITI. The meaning of this is that you're going to make certain basic disclosure, disclosures to your shareholders and to the whole community that companies ordinarily are not required to do. And we'll keep that. We are not going to withdraw as a partner company to the EITI. That means that there are further requirements beyond what we are doing today, beyond just publishing your financial statements. There are very many other disclosure requirements of being a partner company to EITI. We believe that this is good for our company. We'll continue to sustain this. And as a matter of fact, as you may be aware, we are the only company that publishes its uh, operational reports, production, sales, and everything on a monthly basis. No company does this anywhere in the world. There's no requirement to do this. As a matter of fact, I would borrow one of our colleagues' uh, view that uh, we're actually not just transparent, we're actually naked. And we're happy telling people that this is who we are, this is what we are trying to do and on their behalf. And also because companies and your partners, particularly the lending community, the global energy community, would like to see what you are doing. Once they do, trust becomes higher and your ability to access capital becomes real and easier. And ultimately, it gives you all the advantage that it requires. So you lose nothing by being transparent. So there has been no conflict between what we have always done in the recent past and also what we must continue to do because we are now a private company that is required to be much more transparent. As a matter of fact, it's now a global requirement that everywhere you go to seeking for financing, they will ask you, who are you? What do you do? What are your sales? What do you do? And these are basic questions. So needless to say that if you publish what you are doing and the questions become less, and we have seen this in practice, I have seen offer of a billion, $5 billion of, uh, uh, of loan or financing. And the key information we have from those partners is that, look, we know what you are. We know what you are doing. We trust you. And, and this is great for our company and for our country. And we'll continue to build this. And it could be the perfect example for other institutions of the state. Of the state. What happens to your subsidiaries? All the subsidiaries. Because some of your, so, why I raise Sorry. it is, my apologies. Why I raise it is because some of your, uh, some of those outside the unions and so on have said, you know, when companies make the kind of transition that NPC is going to make or is about to make, one of the casualties usually is the workforce. Um, and you have so many. Uh, well, you have workers and you have subsidiaries. And so that's what it's in that context that I, ha I ask the question what happens? to your subsidiaries? Not a, di not a difficulty of any nature at all, because first, the law is very clear that we must keep everybody that is working for the company today. Today, we have a little over 7,000 direct staff of this company. So by law, we are required to keep all of them. We're also required to make sure that they have compensation, not less than what they earn today. So the law has already played that part, so nobody's going to lose his job. But the law also provided that you must be more effective, you must be more efficient, and, and therefore, uh, within us and our unions, there's a perfect understanding. There is a collaboration between us. Everybody understood that we must do things differently. A new culture must set in. There must be consequences, and there must also be appropriate rewards for doing, doing well. So this is basic. This is understood by all. And I'm not sure we have any issues with uh, managing the subsidiaries because the subsidiaries are owned by the parent company. And it's, our relationship are very clear. We have subsidiaries that will become our companies on their own. We're also going to have business units, units that are not necessarily going to become karma companies, and all of them become part of the balance sheet of the NMPC Limited. There's no difficulty managing the people issue out of this. Separate this for me. Um, you have referenced several times uh, the PIA and, you know, and other enabling documents that are going to guide this process. But somewhere earlier on, we also were told that the aspects or some aspects of the PIA were suspended until for 18 months. How does that affect this that you're trying to do? I'm not aware of any suspension of any aspect of the PIA. Because the, the, uh, at the time, just before uh, we had this election primary season, uh, I believe it was the Senate president who went to the president to talk about it. And then subsequently, uh, the minister said, you know, the uh, certain aspects of it, particularly the ones that had to do with 
NNPC operating completely as a commercial entity would be suspended for not, 18 not, months? Not, not at all. It is about the issue of the pricing of petroleum products. Fuji law is very clear. So the state can decide at any point that would like to put subsidy on petroleum or not. And the PIA is also very clear that petroleum will be priced at its commercial value. We still price it at your commercial value. We know the commercial value of this petroleum, but the state can exercise discretion and say, look, yes, it is, but I'm going to pay you for the difference. And that's all the Senate president may have referred to, that we are going to provide uh, funding for the gap between the current commercial value of petroleum and what we want you to sell at, at, the, at the market. And the law has indicated the date when this becomes effective. And what it simply did is that we are going to provide funding for another uh, 18 months. This is really what it is, really not an amendment of the law. It's just a, a position of policy that we are, con we are going to continue providing something. Nothing to do with the change of the position of the P Petroleum Industry Act. Do you think the timing of this change um, is fortuitous? Uh, and I ask why, why you, might, you might wonder why I ask that question. Mm. Um, the administration is going to hand over in May. Yeah. next year. So you've got less than a year. You have midwifed this process yes. uh, up until now, and you are going to see it across to this uh, new stage. Uh, but as we have learned, both with organic and inorganic mm -hmm. institutions, uh, the visioner who puts it together, once that person is no longer in the driving seat, it might be a problem. In our own environment, it might even be a bigger yeah. problem. Yeah. And that's why I ask, yeah. uh, do you think the timing is for teachers coming close to the end of the administration? I don't see any political consideration for this. Uh, as you may be aware, uh, the regulation is clearly spelled out in the petroleum industry that within the time frame. Now, the regulation is about pricing petroleum uh, at the appropriate price. Simply, this is what, what it is now. There are always social circumstances that make government and states to decide whether they are going to provide uh, subsidies on certain commodities. You can subsidize production. You can also subsidize consumption for very different reasons. And, and what the decision the state has made is that it isn't the right moment or the right timing because of economic consideration for us to take out that subsidy because we will be transferring a number of costs, significant costs to consumers, and ultimately it's going to impact on inflation and very many other social considerations that would come. This we understand perfectly. And from the benefit of hindsight today now, we have seen even major democracies, uh, first world countries today, you know, considering and of course even implemented as what clearly is subsidy. For instance, when you take out uh, taxation from petroleum, like it is already being done in very many in the UK, the in the and all this, uh, you are simply putting back subsidy on it. And because of the social situation that uh, those countries have found themselves. Yes, uh, should you price petroleum appropriately? We agree completely that it should be done, but timing is always very critical and it probably doesn't have anything to do with politics. I don't think that's anything to do with politics. May I ask you uh, on a more general note, um, because people, uh, uh, and of course it also has bearing to do with, um, what exactly is the bottleneck in the supply chain? Because at least for the near future, we're still going to be importing most of what we're going to be using for even NNPC mm -hmm. Limited. Um, what is the bottleneck in the supply chain? Because even as you and I sit here in Abuja uh, for this, there are still uh, uh, disruptions. Uh, we're seeing queues in various parts. Mm -hmm. And people are saying, ah, should that NPC leave us in this you know, situation mm -hmm. and then go private and say it's no longer mm -hmm. their yeah. business? Uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, even the person who brought me here asked me the question. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and I said, well, I'm going to speak to the GMD. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask, what, first of all, what, what is causing the supply bottleneck? First of all, let me come that we cannot walk away. The Petroleum Industry Act is very clear in its provision. It said NMPC shall provide energy security for this country. So we'll never walk away. So NMPC cannot walk away. And as a matter of business, you know, it's good we stay because it will be of value to, to NMPC. Now, about supply diversion in the country today, uh, I can tell you today we have over 2 billion liters of petroleum, PMS to be particular, uh, in our hands today. So you do not have supply current like very many countries have globally. 
Today, refineries have shut down in very many jurisdictions. We have made the right decisions, uh, commercial decisions, to make sure that our supply is secure and is av available. And there are countries now struggling to access uh, supply because they can no longer afford to buy in the international market. We have a different situation. We have access to supply. But you also have other delivery constraints. First, when the suppliers get into this country, you know, they must be transported from the mother vessels into tanks. And the cost of that transportation has risen so astronomically that the current framework that we have cannot compensate for it. And sometimes marketers have, do have difficulty having access to those vessels that would transport the petroleum from the larger vessels into the smaller one. We have resolved this. As you do this, you also have another layer of uh, relationship, which means that there are trucks that have to take products from fuel station, from the depots into the fuel station in different parts of the countries. Mr. President, in his wisdom, and we advise him that we need to do something to this. There's a grant of additional 10 naira per liter so that uh, transporters will be able to take their trucks from the depots uh, so that we'll be able to pay for that cost from the depots to the furthest part of this, this, this country. Uh, while you are doing this, you know, you're going to have supply disruption. The, ta the tank driver or the owners will not move your products until they are sure that they are going to be paid. And they have no qualms around this. They have no responsibility. And therefore, you will continue to have those delays presenting trucks to the, to the depots until, until you are able to confirm to them that this is happening. Anytime you have these slippages, you know, you will have supply disruption. And therefore, when you have a delay of two to three days, then you naturally see that coming of uh, in effect. As we speak now, it's only in Abuja that you have this uh, uh, trouble. And the reason is very simple. And we have resolved that too also last, last week. The reason is very simple. Despite the tenor that were put in place, you know, uh, suppliers are still not able to meet their total cost. Uh, the reason is also very simple. As you know, the global uh, situation that we have faced, supply chain issues, disruption, has made it impossible for companies to deliver things at the price that they were six months ago, seven months ago. For instance, a tire of a, of a vehicle now probably costing three times that value if you compare it today and probably a, a year ago. So these are all not factored in the relationship that we have with our suppliers and we're engaging to make sure that we resolve this so that ultimately you have a smoother uh, supply mechanism. Other than this, there are other human issues unavoidable when you are dealing with uh, 33,000 fuel stations in the country, over 33,000 fuel stations in the country. There are over about that number of trucks in the country. So it's, it's a huge uh, enterprise that has its own uh, com complication. But I think we are on top of it today. Uh, we have resolved some of the social issues around it and we think that this will, will normalize as you continue to have disruption, as you have this global scale of uh, challenge that we all have. There are no doubt there are serious global supply chain issues that affect every country. And if you look at it in context and see what happens to other countries and other jurisdictions, we are doing very well. Can we eliminate what we are seeing today? And I can assure you that uh, the steps that we have taken alongside the, the government's institutions uh, will make sure that this will, will go away you know, very, very soon. You are, that, we, we talk about that from the distribution end. Now, let's come to the production end, which is more or less the beginning, yeah. uh, shall we say. The, 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 each time they talk about even this disruption that we're talking about, the situation in the world and high energy prices and so on, mm -hmm. and people say that, well, Nigeria ought to be one of the quote-unquote beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we can't even meet our quota. Uh, and uh, people talk of a lot of things, vandalism, uh, you know, uh, age, aged pipelines, uh, the need for massive investment in new infrastructure and all of that. Now, many of these assets belong to NMPC and um, you'll be taking them with you into this new transformation. So. That then, that, that leaves the question, how are you going to make this possible? Because right now, I for one would be pained that when oil is selling at $100 plus, we are not able to take advantage of it. Uh, and there are those who are saying that's not going to last forever. It's going to go back uh, to 60, 65. Uh, so it's like making hay when the sun shines, so to speak. Um, what are, is going to happen with that? Because again, as I said previously, you may not have access um, to the kind of fund that you're going to require to do that. I mean, if we take the issue of vandalism, uh, uh, maintenance of pipelines and other infrastructure that you use for the production and getting the things to where we can distribute, what are you going to do about that? Yes, firstly, let me speak to the scale of uh, uh, acts of uh, criminals and vandals on our facilities 
in the Niger Delta region today. Uh, we've never seen this scale of uh, disruptions, and the end result is that we are losing over 400,000 barrels of uh, production uh, every, every day. And the complication also is that when you produce and it does not get into a terminal, uh, there will be no incentive for anyone to invest money into this business. And this is the effect that we are seeing. So you're going to have two sets of problems. One is the problem that you are losing production. And secondly, that you are not putting more money because uh, in producing oil, there is always a natural decline. It can be as high as 14% in a, in, a, in a year. So when it declines and you're not putting back money, you are naturally going to lose that production. And you cannot wish it into happening, even if you have the financing. Once you lose uh, production, you'll probably look another 24 months, 18 months for you to bring back, even if you have all the cash that you, you, you require. And are we doing anything about it? Absolutely, yes. And I'm, I'm assuring you that within the next one to two months, you will see massive impact of the interventions that are happening, not probably for this forum to speak about the details, but I can tell you that between us, our partners, the government security agencies, and other multilateral partners, you know, there's a robust pr framework that has started operating uh, that is going to be scaled up and ultimately will contain the acts of vendors. Are we going to eliminate it? Probably not possible to, to give that affirmation, uh, but we have a very robust plan to do this. Once you do this, you're able to get back your production uh, in the shortest possible frame of time. Uh, we still think that we'll take benefit of the high price of uh, petroleum today because we don't see it going away very soon, probably another year of uh, this uh, 80 to 90 dollar oil will, will survive for another year. We think so very strongly. Therefore, we think that we are still in the window where we can take advantage of, of this. But beyond this, you know, there are other infrastructure issues, which I quickly agree with you. When you produce and you are not able to take value from it, no one is going to pick, put money into it. And that's why replacement of assets becomes very, 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 very difficult. So our first focus today is to deal with the bandits and the criminals. And we'll go for them. Uh, we, are, we are engaging, we we'll do everything possible from the smallest of them to the biggest of them. We understand that stealing crude oil and selling in the market is an elitist business and we'll attack it, we'll go frontally so that when we take them down, that everything will come to normalcy and then the, the ordinary people who are naturally just the collateral damage of this uh, act of the bigger people that are in this space uh, will, will vanish and we think that we can restore production into this country uh, in the shortest frame of, frame of time. And of course, uh, beyond this, uh, you can also see even on our product pipeline, for instance, between Atlas Corp and Mosimi, you know, we can no longer uh, pump product into that line for a very, very simple reason that you have these vandals, you know, putting insertions on our pipeline and we're unable to do this. This is also part of the uh, complex framework we are putting in place to make sure that we address these challenges and we will overcome this. But security is not a business of oil companies. And that's why they will tell you, well, you fix it, they will come and work with you. And because we're a business now, it also becomes an issue for us. There's how much, there's a limit to how much you can invest in security by oil produce oil companies. And sure. that is why government has come in strongly to support us, to make sure that this is the responsibility of government and government is really discharging its responsibility on this respect. As a matter of fact, Mr. President has given his clear direction that we must stop this and we must contain it. And, and I can see the line of sight around containing for this. And then of course for assets, you know, what you take an asset, you take is liability. You know, we know there are liabilities, and as always, some of it can even be contingent, legal liabilities, and say, we are taking everything on board, but we still have a very, very robust asset structure. In, the, in, the, in the respective of the current situation that we have found ourselves, this is probably one of the jewel asset com owning company that it can ever have anywhere in the world. When you answered one of my earlier questions, you talked about the, the, the component of your assets that is uh, pet, uh, petroleum products being just about 20% and uh, the others being about 80%. And I assume among that 80% will be gas because, I mean, we have even more gas than we have petroleum. And, and gas is now being touted as one of the cleaner fuels. Well, so uh, what's your plan for that? Because my guest, the man who was sitting in the chair you are, you are now sitting in last week, said he he would only wish that he would be you know, around to see Nigeria take advantage of its gas assets. That because when we begin to do that, our petroleum assets will fall by the wayside. People will make reference to it only as a footnote because what we can do with gas is so much. Now you're talking commercial, you're talking making money. <laughs> so what, 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 what's the plan for that? What's the plan in that regard? First and foremost, I think there's something that many Nigerians are not aware of. We're actually a gas country, more than an oil country. 
but the focus has always been on the oil. So people will have lost sight of the value and potential of gas that we have in this country. And every country that has developed you know, globally, particularly resource-dependent countries, will be at the back of their gas resources. And those gas resources will give you all the requirements and all the uh, provisions that we require to bring in energy into your country, convert the gas into better use, fertilizer, chemicals, methanol, urea, and so on and, and so forth. That is the quickest way of producing prosperity much more than, much more than oil. And therefore, uh, government in its wisdom, which we completely uh, understand, and even as a commercial company now, this is the right thing to do, that it has declared a decade of gas. That means that we'll shift our focus from oil to, the, to gas in 10 years. And by that time, we would have been able to increase domestic consumption of gas from where we are today to as high as 10 billion scope of gas uh, per, uh, per day. Uh, the meaning of this is that you will have enough gas for power. You will be creating so much local chemicals and other associated materials that comes from gas. And more than anything, is the, the implication also is that you're going to have multiplier effect on creating jobs, employment, you know, taxation, and all kinds of things that will follow once investment follows. So we have a line of sight, but most importantly, you must have the right infrastructure. And that is why we're very focused on creating the trunk infrastructure that links the gas resources into the centers of consumption and cutting across the entire country to the east, to the west, and to the north, so that when you have the trunk infrastructure, you will now be able to inject gas, and the capacity of what we are trying to do now will surely contain the about 8 billion scope that we require in the short term. And of course, uh, ordinarily with time, you will see more investment will come even from private sector to make sure that we can expand this over a period of time. The value will come. There are issues, no doubt, around pricing. That also has is being resolved. And so that once pricing is clear, people can recover their costs, they can recover their margin. You will see more private uh, investment in this. For us, it is perfect opportunity. One of our best performing companies is the gas company that we have. And, and we know that the gas has value. You mentioned two things, which bring two things to my mind as well, when you talked about gas. Earlier on, you mentioned it in passing, when you talked of cooking gas. Yes. So much potential in that regard, because so many Nigerians are not able to access that. Also, pricing issues are there. Then there's the gas to power, mm. uh, which is supposed to help give the country light um, and change its dynamics. Um, so again, value addition for the NNPC um, as a private company co going forward. Mm. Give, give, give us an idea of how you see that unfolding. How do you see that unfolding as the CEO of a private company? Yes, first of all, um, the company by law now is required to de declare dividend to its shareholders. That means that at any time, your cost must be lower than your income. And there's no way you can do this except you are efficient so that your cost becomes small and your revenue becomes higher. When you pay off your taxation and your royalties, you will have a net position. So for you to maintain that, you must be efficient, you must be world class, and you must focus on the right business. And that's why you need, we are focusing on our upstream and our gas business. That's where all the money is going to come from. As we also grow our other businesses to the extent that it is practical today, to the extent that it can deliver value to our, to, our, to our business. So they go together. The downstream business is clearly where the bulk of uh, uh, commercial transactions will take place. This is what is visible to all. But in terms of its value to its shareholders, you know, the downstream is far less than your gas business and your upstream. So we are refocusing our business on the most important part of our business as we are also growing our other businesses. And, and for a karma company, you know, there's no doubt that... Uh, uh, these two must play. As a matter of fact, well, there's a requirement to law that if you do, don't make profit for three years, you become bank, declared bankrupt, and you can actually be liquidated. But, but clearly, NMPC is not one in that bracket of companies that have any risk of liquidation. Uh, well, it will be the most capitalized company in, in, in Africa. In Africa. Mm -hmm. I, 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 talk, I, I want to talk about what you mentioned earlier when you, mentioned, when you talked about the refineries. When last I spoke to you, the process was just beginning then. Mm -hmm. Uh, and as I said, that's just about a year ago. Where are we with those repairs? Because people have told me, including some industry experts, that unless we have control, like you as NNPC have control, over some aspect of the local production, this supply chain bottlenecks for the local market are likely to continue because there are forces outside the country 
that you won't con that you are not able to control, even including things like foreign exchange rate. Mm -hmm. So even if prices remain stable, because the foreign exchange rate has changed, the value in terms of in being in country will change also. So in that respect, where are we with the refineries in terms of that process you uh, explained to us about? Yes, the um, uh, first, uh, it's always painful uh, discussing why our refineries are not working today. Uh, it also amounts to lamentation when you continue to say that uh, it's not working and so on and so forth. So we regret this. You know, it's very painful for, for NMPC. But we can't explain why we're here because there's really no justification for, for anything. I've always said this, that, that we, we shouldn't lament. So, but what are we doing about it today? I think that's the important thing. First, our, our work has gone very advanced stage in the Potaco refinery rehabilitation. We will fix the water refinery and also the Kaduna, Kaduna refinery. I do not want to uh, bore Nigerians with uh, lamentations. Uh, the results will speak. We don't want to tell you that we haven't done this and that. But of course, uh, what is very obvious uh, globally is that the closer you are to the source of supply, you also have greater security of uh, supply. No doubt there's a very, very wide connection between uh, these, these two. So that's what we're working to make sure that we, we are back to production. And also remember that we have 20% equity in the Dangote refinery. We now have a vested interest in making sure that refinery comes on board. And I'm convinced that by the quarter one of 2023, we will be able to bring that uh, refinery into production. Once that happens, and we're able to bring back our refineries on stream, then the issue of local consumption vanishes. We now become a supplier to the West African sub region, and we now have stability of supply in, in our region. I mean, in the meantime, you know, this is a very global market, as, as you may be aware. You know, once you have the right contracts, at the right plants that you're relating with the right customers or suppliers that you are dealing with, you know, you can always access petroleum in the market, particularly if you are ready to pay the, the right price for, for it. So uh, traders are very good at this, you know, we will, they will always find product and bring to you. But mind you, when it becomes so difficult, when there's a constraint of supply in the global market, countries take position as we have noticed uh, sometimes, you know, some countries stop export of uh, petroleum product because of the fear that, you know, this... Uh, crisis in Ukraine will, will subsist for a long time. So we know this, uh, we're dealing with it. Uh, we're taking the right position in the market to make sure that we don't lose that supply disruption. But our ultimate objection is to get our refineries functional, bring back uh, the, uh, get the Dangote refinery to start operating. And once we're done, these Nigerians can have a side of relief. Uh, because, and, but we'll not stop there. As you do this, we'll continue to get cleaner. Uh, more uh, different kind of cleaner fuels would be on the table, and it's a, it's a development process. Not for today, yes, but I'm sure that in, in 10 years' time, when we turn back and look at our country, we'll have sufficient share of energy in all its form, but particularly more of them coming from our gas resources. Malam Melakiari, good luck with this. Yes. Thank you for it's, speaking with us. It's tough, but we'll, we'll get it done. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's our program today. We would, of course, like to hear from you on the conversation. Our social media handles are right there on your screen. You can also listen to this and previous episodes of the program via our podcast. Please visit our website, channelstv.com forward slash podcast to get started. I am Ladi Akiri Duluali. Goodbye. <laughs>